chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, perhaps the best known passage in scripture at the end. We're just finishing the last verse of chapter 12. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to open up God's Word once again as we continue through 1 Corinthians. Let's just ask the Lord uh, one more time for his help and blessing as we seek to unpack what he has to say to us tonight. Our Father, we want to come before you uh, with great humility. You are God and we were made from the dust. As we have sung, you are the ancient of days, and we are but a mist and a vapor. Lord, we will all wither and perish like the grass, but your word endures forever. And so, Lord, we open up that uh, ever-enduring word tonight, and we pray that you would help us. We pray that you would come and visit us. We know whenever it is read, you are speaking and we pray that you would speak in a powerful way tonight. You are the great searcher of hearts. What is hidden from our sights, you see altogether clearly. I pray you may search our hearts. I pray that you may lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, if there is anything that you find that displeases you, may you purify us. And Lord, where there are things that are pleasing to you, may you encourage us. But in all of this, I pray you'd encourage us with the Lord Jesus Christ because of his fullness we have all received. And in him there is hope and there is forgiveness in his name. So we thank you, Lord, we pray and ask for your blessing upon this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, man has virtually mastered this world we have been mastering the seas for some time now. We can travel wherever we like. We've mastered the skies by a plane. We have lifted off into the stratosphere and we have tra uh, traversed through the universe, as it were, 
We have mastered foreign languages. We have mined the earth for precious resources and minerals. We know how to plant and harvest. When you get right back and you look at Babel, they thought they were accomplishing something pretty great, didn't they? Building something to the heavens. If they had even a glimpse of what we would achieve a few thousand years later. If only they had a glimpse. We have mastered so much. What about the church? How much has the church mastered? How much has the church accomplished? We have great buildings. We have great resources. We have the latest technology. We have ministries for every age group, for every need. We reach outside of the doors into the community. We have the latest equipment. We have pastors and staff workers, and we can do it all. But something that the world has lacked in all of our achievements, you see it, right? The heartbeat of this passage, love. It has lacked love. And what if the church in all of her accomplishments, in all that she has to her name, what if she's missing love? That's exactly what Paul wants to deal with tonight. If you were here or you tuned in for last week, he was addressing that we are a family and that everyone is needed. doesn't matter what role you play. God has given you that role. He's given you that gift and you need to serve him with it. But he showed us you need to serve. You need to serve. You're part of the body. But remember how we finished off. It doesn't, it's not just important that you serve. It's important how you serve. And so we can do so much, but if we have not love, the house falls apart, just as the world is falling apart. And so this is where we are this evening. We saw at the end uh, where Martin left off for us. The end of verse 12 is really the bridge there. Now I will show you the most excellent way. Firstly tonight, our first point, love is the spiritual measure of a Christian. Love is the spiritual measure of a Christian. Now, Paul gives here for us in these first three verses, three scenarios. And each scenario has exaggerated elements to it. Each of them uh, contains hyperbole. And each situation contains a person who is extremely gifted, extremely gifted, a greatly gifted servant, as it were. Look at the first scenario here. Verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. This is the gift of tongues that was given at Pentecost. Pastor Ian dealt with it a few weeks ago. This is the gift of human languages. And as we saw last week and the week before, this is the language that the Corinthians, uh, the, the gift that the Corinthians esteemed the most. This was the best gift to them, the most prized. But do you notice the exaggeration and the hyperbole in the scenario? Look how he stretches it. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... Now, this is a kind of style that Jesus often used this kind of style, right? To make a point, he stretched the illustration. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. To make a point, Jesus would stretch it so that you feel the weight of it. And Paul says, even if you have the greatest gift spiritual gift, supposedly according to you, the gift of tongues. And even if you have frequent conversation with angels, even if you do that, yet if you are without love, you are a racket and you are a clanging cymbal. You are a racket. Now, it's a remarkable statement. Imagine someone walks into church and they start speaking in all of these unlearned languages Languages that they've never studied. And then they come back the following week and they tell you, by the way, on multiple occasions, I have been communing with angels this past week. If it came out in Christianity that this was happening, that person would be one of the most sought-after preachers in church pulpits around the country. Out of Nine out of ten churches would be demanding to have this person who is just incredibly spiritual gifted and that the Spirit of God is upon in a unique way. And yet Paul says, that person that you want to invite in, if they're not marked by love, 
Don't let them up here. Don't let them up. It'll be noise and a racket. Now, the imagery that he gives here, picture walking into a grade two primary school class, a music class, right? They go off to music. Four kids are given shakers. Two kids are given tambourines. Another few kids are giving a triangle. Another few a recorder. And two kids are, gi- are given cymbals. Now, out of all those instruments, the kids that need to use the most care are the cymbals. They are the loudest. If you play them slightly too loud, you ruin everything and it becomes chaos in a moment. You, you can picture it, right? And Paul says the loveless gift, the person who serves in church without love, they are like a kid smashing symbols together. And when you gather, God reaches for the earmuffs. He can't take it. It hurts the divine ears. Some people, Paul says, love being gifted more than they love people. Scenario 2, look at verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Now, this person that he's kind of summarizing, even though he's speaking the first person, this person has multiple spiritual gifts. Prophecy, discernment, literally there, all knowledge, all faith. This person is extraordinary gifted, extraordinarily gifted, four of the spiritual gifts and all of the most esteemed ones. But notice again the exaggeration and the hyperbole. Do you see it in the, in the verse there? This person can fathom all mysteries. They have all knowledge and they have all faith so as to be able to move mountains. You are looking at a God-man here. This person is like God. What does Deuteronomy 29, 29 say? The secret things belong to the Lord. This person knows all of the secret things, can fathom all the mysteries, has all knowledge. This person is omniscient. Only God is omniscient. And Paul says, even if such a person exists, If they existed, if they are not marked by love, they're nothing. They are nothing. And he says, even if they have all faith so as to move mountains. Now, this isn't referring to saving faith. This is referring to the supernatural gift of faith that some Christians have. It's a spiritual gift. And the, the person that I could compare this the most likely to would probably be, I know it's Old Testament, but would be Abraham. God promises him a son. Abraham waits almost forever, becomes an old man, finally gets this son, the inheritance. And when his little boy starts growing up, God says, kill him. Kill him as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham picks up the knife. He picks it up and he goes to slay his one and only son. How could he do that? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead gift of faith. Paul's point, though, is you and I could have that kind of amount of faith, right, where we trust God with our lives. We could have that gift of faith. But if we don't have love, we are not like Abraham. We are more like Jonah. We are more like Jonah. Jonah had great faith. He believed that God could save the most arguably wicked nation on the earth, Nineveh. He believed that God could do it. What was his problem? He hated them. He didn't love them. Listen to what, it, what Jonah says when he complains to the Lord after the Lord shows love to the people. Jonah 4.2, O oh Lord, isn't this what I said before? I knew you were gracious, slow anger, abundant in love. Now, Lord, please take my life. Death is better to me than life. It's disturbing, isn't it? Such faith, and yet such, his, his love was as cold as ice. One writer commenting on the life of Jonah said this, let me quote him. A more loveless man is hard to imagine. His faith told him a great success would come in Nineveh, but the prophet was a great failure. The preaching wrought a great miracle, as he believed it would, but the preacher was a nothing Everything Jonah knew God was, 
Jonah wasn't. End quote. Let me ask you, do you have spiritual gifts? If you're a Christian, you do. Let me ask you another question. Do you serve in this church? Do you serve here? Do you contribute to the advancement of the kingdom through this church? But at the same time, do you have any ill feelings towards any brothers or sisters in this church? Do you have any ill feelings? Is there some here that you don't love? Is there any? Paul says, if that's any of us, if that's you, if that's me, I am nothing. You are nothing. Not your gift becomes nothing. Not your ministry becomes nothing. You are nothing. I am nothing. That's strong language. That is really strong language. What is the vital truth that he's trying to get Christians to learn from this? Giftedness and service is not the spiritual measure of a Christian. It's not. It's not. There's a story of a great preacher. You've probably heard it before. He's an itinerant preacher. And he went around and he went to fill in the pulpit for another congregation. And he preached up a storm. After the service, a woman came down the aisle to him. And she came to him and said, You must be such a holy man to be able to preach like that. Such a man of God. And he turned to her and he said, would you assume that of me after listening to one of my sermons? Would you think that of me just for listening to one of my sermons? Go and talk to my wife. Ask her if I'm a godly man. And on another occasion, someone came up to him and said, I wish you were our preacher after listening to that sermon. I wish you were my pastor. I wish we had you in our pulpit. And he said, what are you talking about? I don't know any of your people. How can you say this of me? Because we forget this truth. Giftedness is not the measure of a Christian. You can be gifted and have no love. You're nothing. I'm nothing. What is, what is the measure then? The fruit of the Spirit. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? What's the foremost fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love. This is it. And this is what Paul says. So the spiritual math formula for the Christian is this. A spiritually gifted person take away love equals nothing. A gifted person minus love equals zero. You are nothing. I am nothing. That's what he's showing us here. Look at scenario three, verse three. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, this is the spiritual gift of generosity, right? It's one of the spiritual gifts, generosity. And yet, look at the exaggeration again. Look at the hyperbole of the, of the example here. If I give all I possess away... Everything. This is literally every cent to your name. Selling all of your assets so that you have zero in your account. Zero to your name. Everything is emptied. Look at the lengths here. This is what the rich young ruler couldn't do, right? He couldn't do this. But he exaggerates the scenario again. Look, he goes a step further. And if I surrender my body to the flames, they say death by fire. Death by being burnt alive is said to be the most painful way a person can die. If I surrender my body even to the flames, I give more than my money, I even die being burnt at the stake. Burnt at the stake. And yet, if I do all of that, empty everything in Christ's name, die in Christ's name, yet do not have love, I gain nothing. Do you see how weighty that is? You give absolutely everything. There is nothing left, not even your life. And what does he say? You gain nothing. You give everything away, you gain nothing. Because you were without love. We can tithe, we can give to mission, we can give to charity, we can give our time to this church without love. You will gain nothing and God disregards it all. It will all be burnt up. Who is the greatest example of giving everything away that he had to the poor? 
Who's the greatest example of giving everything to the poor? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The prince of heaven leaves the wealth of heaven, the treasures of heaven, the security of heaven, all of that so that he can make poor, helpless, hell-bound sinners rich. He can make them children of God. He can make them co-heirs with Christ who have an unshakable inheritance, who gain everything. He empties of his riches to fill us up. Who surrendered their body? Who gave up their body? Pastor Ian prayed it before, but this famous verse that we know, it speaks insightfully into our passage tonight. You know the verse, Philippians 2, 6, 7, Jesus Christ being in the very nature God did not account equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing, born as a man in the form of a servant. Do you see what Paul's saying here? You may do the greatest things, but without love you are nothing. Jesus Christ, who was the greatest of all, he loved us by making himself nothing. We have to see this is the essence of Christianity. Love. Love. So hopefully you've seen the progression of these scenarios. He says, if you don't love, you're a racket. Then he says, if you don't love, you're nothing. And then he says, if you don't love, you gain nothing. There's no eternal life. This is steep. This is steep. Let's look at the second, second point this evening. We see what love does and doesn't do. What love does and doesn't do. Now, in order to paint, he's not just going to be so strong with us and then leave us with some kind of trying to guess then, well, how are we supposed to leave? He's not going to do that. He's going to paint love for us, but in order to show it in its richness, he shows us what love does and what love doesn't do so that you can get the full picture of love here. Now, it's quite clear as you run your eyes, you know these verses, so we'll try and work through them in a helpful way, but one thing that we can all see very clearly, he shows us what love looks like, not what love feels like. Okay, we've already moved away from the world's definition. We're going to see what love looks like, not what it feels like. What love is, first. What love is. Look at verse 4 there. What it is. Love is patient and love is kind. So he says two aspects of what love is. Patient and kind. That word patient there is long-suffering. It's, that's the old word. That's, that's the richest way to think of patience. It's long-suffering. It endures ill treatment. It waits and gives time to others. It's very precious. The imagery is of a log, a thick piece of wood in the fire. It's slow burning. It gives off warmth, but it's slow burning. So much of love today is more like the newspaper that you throw in. It's so bright when you chuck it in, you think, wow, this is how you get the fire going. But it only lasts a few seconds. It's not long burning. It's not long suffering. It doesn't last long. See, patience keeps the family of God warm because it lasts for a long time. It's long burning. Now, we see this patience and long-suffering is a characteristic of God. We learn it from Him. Isaiah 65, 2, God says this, All day long I have held out my hands to a stiff-necked people, a people who continually provoke me to my very face. So you've got these people who are scoffing and mocking and ridiculing God to His face, and God's pictured like this. Come, come. And post-cross, As people ridicule and mock God, it's the sun now, like this. Come, come. And he's got the scars in his hands. Come, come. It's long-suffering. It's long-suffering. There is that famous uh, atheist. He's a lecturer. His name's Robert Ingersoll. Robert Ingersoll. And he became renowned for his lectures uh, against the existence of God. And he used to say some outrageous 
uh, kind of provocative statements in his lectures. And on one occasion, he said this to his students. As he's arguing against the existence of God, he said, I'll give God five minutes to strike me dead for the things I have said. I'll give him five minutes. And he went quiet. And he let the time pass. After the time went off, he said to the students, See, God doesn't exist. Now we look at that and it's shocking, right? It's so provocative to the very face of God. Yet one Christian looked at what that atheist did and this is what he commented. He said this, And did this gentleman think he could exhaust the patience of the eternal God in five minutes? See what he's saying here? We hear what the atheist does and we're horrified. We think of the arrogance and we shudder and we're terrified. But he wants us to think here. Do we think that one minuscule creature of the dust could exhaust the patience of the Almighty God in five minutes? Our view of God's patience is too small. It's too small. We view God's patience like the newspaper in the fire, not the thick log that's slow burning. God is patient, and, it's, and, and love is patient. And he also says here, love, what else is it? It is kind. This is to be moved with pity and compassion towards others. It sees the burden of others, and it shoulders the burden. Okay? It sees the need, and it meets the need. And understand this. If you hear anything, this is not just towards friends. It's not just towards friends. That's why when Jesus taught about loving our neighbor, he gives the good, good Samaritan as the example. He gives the enemy as the example. It's not for your, just for your friends. It's for those who wrong you. And there's an important relationship here between patience and kindness. Patience is willing to endure anything from others. Kindness is willing to give anything for others. The two sides of the one coin. We absorb and we cop. And we, we let it hit, uh, hit after hit after hit. And on the other side of the coin, we give whatever is needed, whatever is necessary. And this is God, right? Romans 2.4, do you despise God's patience, not recognizing that his kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? His patience and his kindness. God endures provocation and he freely gives the gift of time so that people can repent. So that's what love is. Now what love isn't, what love doesn't do. Again, he's painting the picture richly here. Look at verses 4 to 6. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Now, compare the positives with the negatives, right? We saw two positives. Look at the list of all the things he says love isn't. Maybe that's because we're so prone to doing what love isn't. In all of those things that it isn't, he's trying to say, love starves the sinful flesh. Love starves our sinful nature. Love doesn't do these things that your flesh wants you to do. Look at the first one. Love starves envy. You know, wishing you had what others had. Or when envy gets really bad, you wish people didn't have what they had. It takes it to the next level. And the Bible won't let us look at envy as a small thing, as a small sin. It won't let us do this. Envy led to the first murder. It did. Envy led Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery. Envy led King Saul to hunt down David like a vile animal. And envy led the religious leaders to kill the Son of God. What did Pilate say to the religious leaders when Jesus was on trial? Matthew 27. For Pilate knew they handed Jesus over out of envy. Envy. It's no small sin. What are the reasons why we envy? If that person is more gifted, they're more attractive, more attractive. They're more recognized. They get more praises. Their life's so much better than mine, more comfortable than mine. They have so much more than me. And we envy. Be careful of envying brothers and sisters. You need to starve that envy. And secondly, he says, love starves boasting, which was the massive problem at Corinth. Remember we saw last week, they were boasting in their giftedness. Boasting is not loving. Why not? 
Well, envy longs to be like others. Boasting, it makes people envy you. It doesn't love them because you make them want to be you or to have what you have when we boast. And you're not loving the person. And Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians for this, right? That wonderful verse that we all should memorize and we all should take to heart. Uh, it's back in chapter uh, 4 where he says, For what makes you different to anyone else? For what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it as a gift, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Why would you boast by your gifts? It's a gift. Thirdly, love starves pride. Again, another problem at Corinth. It means to be puffed up. If love, guys, if love builds up, builds up the family of God, pride tears the whole house down. It tears the whole thing down brick by brick. And again, God hates pride. He kicks Satan out of heaven for it. He kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden for it. And pride is filling hell with souls every day, every single day. The pride of man those who are proud cannot love. They will not take a rebuke. They will not take correction. They're too above people. They will not be taught. They will not be instructed. We need to starve it. And when we starve it, when we give no inch to pride, we are like Christ. We are like Jesus. Jesus, who was content to be born to a teen mom. He's the king of glory. Born in the stable, poverty of family, did not have his own place, did not have a wardrobe. He died a criminal's death and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. This is like Christ, to be humble. How do we starve pride? How do we do it? There is a great hymn. We sing it occasionally in, in the mornings when I survey the wondrous cross. How do we starve pride? The lyrics part of that hymn says this, When I survey the wondrous cross, my richest gain I count as loss and pour contempt on all my pride. When I look at him hanging there, it makes me hate my pride. Who is Nathan that a prime minister should die for him or a president should die for him? Who is Nathan that a king should die for him? What is Nathan that the Son of God should die for him? There is nothing in me, absolutely nothing. How can I be proud when I see him hanging there in my place? We look at the cross and we pour contempt on all our pride. Fourth, love starves rudeness. You see it there. Indecency. Love is not indecent. Christian women, you can love your brothers at church by dressing modestly. And men, you can do the same by loving your sisters. Love is not innuendos. It's not rude. It's not indecent. Fifth, love starves selfishness. You see it there, self-seeking, selfishness. Now, this is the epitome of humanity's fallenness. Selfishness. And the remnants of it keep surfacing even in the Christian it's a wild beast that needs to be tamed every single day. One commentator, he says this about it. Quote, Cure selfishness and you have just replanted the Garden of Eden. That's how pervasive selfishness is in our world. What does self-seeking and selfishness look like? What does it look like in the church? It's this consumeristic mindset what the church has to offer me, what the church would do for me. The sermons are my style. The sermons fit me. The music fits me, my preferences. The people, the services, the things that I attend to are people who are like me, people who get me. Everything me, my way, my way, church, my way. What did Jesus say? I came not to be served, but to serve. And that's why wherever Jesus walked, it was like the Garden of Eden was replanted. Because he didn't seek his own interests. He wasn't selfish. It wasn't about him and all of that. It was about our need. My wants, my way has no place in the church. Why did Jesus die? Why did he die? To forgive us? Yes. 
to reconcile us to God? Yes. To help us to escape, to free us from hell? Yes. Why else did he die for us? 2 Corinthians 5.15, And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose for them. He died to cure our selfishness. He died to liberate us from selfishness so that we could serve and love him and love each other and love this world. That's why he died, to liberate us from that. Six, love starves irritability. It's not easily angered or short-tempered. We already looked at patience, so we won't flesh that out. But for some of us, this might be more of a struggle than others. It's not easily worked up. Seven, love starves grudges. Love starves grudges. See there? Love keeps no record of wrongs. The NIV is a bit weak. Literally, it says it keeps no record of evils and wrongs. Those who trespass against us. The imagery here is of someone who writes down an offense, they jot jot it down and file it away. It's kept filed away. This is what he is getting at here. Let me ask you, whose offenses have you jotted down? In the church, are there brothers or sisters whose offenses you've, you've jotted down and you've filed it away in your heart and it's tucked away there? It's tucked away. Understand this. There is only one book of judgment. There is only one book of the remembrance of sins and that belongs to God. It belongs to God and it will be opened on judgment day. We're not allowed to keep those record books. We're not allowed to have those record books. And what has God done with a record against us? What does it say? Hebrews 8, 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. The loving, gracious forgetfulness of God. The loving forgetfulness of God. It's not that he gets amnesia when we become a Christian and he forgets our past. He chooses not to bring them up. He knows them, but he doesn't bring them up. He hasn't filed them away to bring them up. Verse 6 is very fitting for our world. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. What is the slogan of our society that we live in? Love is love. And that is championed by the LGBTQI fan base. Love is love. All of those sexual preferences that that slogan covers and that lifestyle that it celebrates... All that is supposed love. It's not love at all. Why? It's not love at all. Why not? What does he say? Because love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. What does the love out there do? It rejoices in evil and hates the truth. It's not love. We must teach our children this. Verse 7, as we finish just this section, as we move to wrapping up here. I thought it was interesting, the NIV virtually translate this different to nearly every other 70 plus English translations that we have. Literally it reads this, if I can read it from the Greek. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Now I haven't got time to flesh that out, but if we can summarize what he's saying here in verse 7. He's saying love is to be shown in all circumstances, at every time, and in every sphere and facet of our life. He's saying love never takes a holiday. Love gets no annual leave. It's never allowed to clock off. Love must permeate everything. Well, let's look at our last point tonight as we... Wrap up, and I'll be brief here in this last section. The final section, Paul says that love will outlive this world. Love will outlive this world. And this is really the crescendo of the passage. And he's going to show that love is supreme. It outweighs, overshadows, surpasses all that they prized most, right? The gifts of ministry. Look at verses 8 and 9. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. These gifts are going to fade away, he says. A time is coming when sermons will no longer happen. A time when ministries will all be finished. They'll be cancelled and done away with. When evangelism and and outreach will be stopped. 
completely. No more evangelism. All of it is going to become redundant. All of it made redundant. And he's saying here, all these spiritual gifts, they have an expiry date. They're going to be finished. When will this happen? Verses 9 to 10, have a look. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Now, as you know, this is a quite a famous verse. I guess the, que- the big question is, what does when perfection comes mean? Now, there's two main views here, right? Saying these gifts are going to finish up, these revelatory gifts are going to finish up when perfection comes, when the perfect arrives, it says. What's that referring to? Well, there's two options. One, the first option is it's referring to when the scriptures have been were finished being written. So this would be the, the late 90s AD. When Revelation was finished, the last, that's it. That's when the perfect comes. We've got the perfect scriptures, the word of God in all of its fullness. That's option one. The second option is when perfection comes is referring to Jesus' return. Those gifts will finish up when Jesus returns. There's arguments on both sides here. Personally, I'd probably lean towards the second one, when Christ comes. And I think verse 12 sheds some light on it. Look at verse 12. Again, both, both points have some uh, good arguments. Verse 12. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. See, when... when when shall we see face to face? It's when he's coming back. When shall we know as we are fully known? It's when he's coming back. Again, there are arguments for the other side. But here it seems to indicate when Christ returns. When he comes, there's going to be no unbelievers to reach, right? Evangelism done, prophecy all done, no unbelievers. And these other gifts are going to finish up too because the church is not going to need to mature into Christ's likeness because she's going to be like Christ. So those gifts are not going to be necessary anymore. So when Jesus returns, he's going to wrap up history and he's going to wrap up all the gifts and they're never going to be reopened. That's it. Paul says they're done away with. And contrast now that with verse 8. What did he say? Love never fails. Literally, love never falls. Love never drops. Love doesn't expire. And then he gives these... Two illustrations here, verse 11 and 12. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. You see what he's saying here? In the mornings when I say goodbye to the kids and I look at Flora and I say to her, Flora, she's only two, what are you, what are you doing today? And she says, uh, going to shops and to park. And she says, Daddy coming too? I say, I can't, sweetie. Daddy's got to, daddy's got to work. No, 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 no. Daddy has to come with Flora. Daddy come for I said, no, I can't, darling. Sorry. What's going on here? Her worldview is as broad as herself. That's about as far as it extends. What's happening in her life? Paul says here, when I was a child, I reasoned like a child. I was only wrapped up in the here and now. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. He says, there's different stages of life. Children become adults. Spiritual gifts will no longer be needed because we will reach completion and perfection and we'll be like Christ and we'll be with him. The gifts won't last. And the second illustration there is, in verse 12, we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. He compares it from looking into a mirror as opposed to seeing someone face to face. You know what it's like. You look in a mirror, it shows you only so much. That's why you keep going back to check, right? You look in the mirror. I don't know anyone who looks only once. You go, you look, you're like, uh, then you go back again. It doesn't show you the full picture. When you see face to face, or when you see a video of yourself, you're like, oh my goodness, is that how I left the house? You see more aspects to it. And this is what he's saying here. Despite all of our giftings and and all the revelation that they give, we only know in part now, but the time is coming when we're going to know everything. We're going to see everything. He's trying to give us perspective of the life to come. And look how he summarizes this, verse 13. And now, this is the crescendo, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Right? 
At the beginning of the passage, he brought up their three favorite gifts, tongues, prophecy, and knowledge. And now he brings up the three greatest Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love. And he says the greatest of these is love. You know what's interesting? He doesn't tell us why love is the greatest here. He says it, but he doesn't give us the explanation. So we've got to kind of look into it ourselves. Why is love the greatest? Well, think about it. Hope will be fulfilled on that day when we see Christ. You know what the scriptures say? Who hopes for what they already have? We're going to have the kingdom. We don't, we don't need to hope, as it were. The kingdom hoped for will be the kingdom finally possessed. What about faith? Well, when we get to heaven, we're still going to believe in God. We're going to spend eternity believing in Him. But Scripture continually says, on that day, our faith will be turned to sight. Right? We're going to see Him. But love, love, the world will be filled. The new heavens and the new earth will be filled with the love of the Trinity. The love of Jesus as His bride walks down the aisle comes to Him. The love of God's people towards Him and our love to each other. Love transcends and goes beyond judgment day from this life to the next. And so Paul's saying to the Corinthians here as he reaches the climax of the passage, he's saying, if love endures into eternity, if the new heavens and the new earth are marked by love, if it's going to be a world of love, then we should make it our aim to be marked by it in the here and now. We should be marked by love. If you're going to master anything, master love. Love builds up, but where there is no love, the house is torn down brick by brick. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we have a familiar passage, and yet it is nonetheless a very precious passage. Lord, we should all readily put up our hand and say we do not love as we ought. We do not love as we ought. I pray that you would show us the areas that you would want us to change, the areas that need working on. We pray that this would be something that we grow into. I pray that we would look with new eyes, that we would not evaluate ourselves by how much we are serving or our giftedness, but Christ's likeness in echoing his love and imitating his love. Lord, we all readily confess that we fall short of the love in this passage. As we read it, we almost find ourselves suffocating by the standard of love that you've set before us. Help us to behold love incarnate, your dear Son. We thank you that he has lived in our place and he has died in our place. And so where we fall short, we thank you that he has paid it in full and he has earned a righteousness for us. And so, Lord, we want to love because you have loved us and you've made us fit for eternity. I pray for our church here at CHBC that we would be a people marked by love, the love that we see recorded in this passage the love that we see in the Godhead, the love shown in Jesus Christ. And we pray these things for your glory. Amen. Let's close with the final uh, song.